Everyone Porter for Files, followed by Simon Lyle. Please. Thank you. Is the mic working? You may start. I'll just... Is it? Is it working? No? Is it, is it working now? It is? Okay, cool. All right, so uh, how not to delete your important files. For those of you with a really short attention span, this Oops, is the too long, didn't read version. Now, for the rest of you, um, basically the idea for writing this tool came about um, after I tried to clean up one of my system directories by basically deleting a, a folder that was in user lib. So this is what I did as root. But I got a weird error message. I got this error message. That's not the directory I was trying to delete. What the hell is this talking about? So I looked carefully at what I actually typed, and I made a little typo. <laughs> now, of course, to be fair, it did delete the directory I wanted to, to get rid of, but it did a whole lot more than this, because it recursively deleted all of my user lib. Now, that was not that great. So how do you recover from this? Well, first step, of course, is to swear a lot. Um, <laughs> Then the second step is to reinstall dpackage. <laughs> now, you don't have a package manager at this point because that's what you're trying to install. So you have to like, unpack your dev, you have to copy the files in the right place, lots of fun. Next step, reinstall apt. Now, of course, apt is the thing that does all of the, um, the dependency resolution. So you have to do, a, do that by hand with dpackage. Lots of fun again. Then, finally, you can get a list of all of the packages that are installed on your system. Now, thankfully, that's not in user lib, that's in var lib, so I still had that. And then, in a loop, you just ask apt-get to reinstall every single package on your system. Uh, all in all, it's an afternoon of good fun, and um, that made me realize that on my machine, there were a couple of directories that are special. Now, they're special because if I'm trying to delete them, it's almost certainly a mistake. I cannot see a good reason for me to want to delete these directories. So what I did is that I wrote a little wrapper that I called safeRM, and uh, that basically has a blacklist of directories uh, or, or files that should never be deleted under any circumstances. Um, the way that it works is that it's installed as user bin rm, uh, which on Debian comes before slash bin in your path, so it takes over the real rm command. Uh, which also means that, of course, if you do want to host your system, you can just do it directly like this with an absolute path. <laughs> um, but otherwise, if you, if you try to do this, what you get instead is a little message that says, oh, I'm just going to skip that directory because you probably don't want to delete it. Um, now, this is the, list, uh, the default list of protected paths that come with, uh, built in with SafeRM. Well, no, actually, slash, you can no longer do that with GNU RM. It will, uh, if you do rm rf slash, it's, it's going to skip it automatically. Um, there you go. Um, so those are the two places where you can add directories if you want to supplement the ones that are uh, built in. So you can do it system-wide or on a per-user basis. And uh, basically, all I wanted to say is that if you think that's a good idea, do this before you need it. And um, if you can help uh, package it for other distros than, than Debian and Ubuntu, uh, please get in touch with me. I'd be happy to do that. OK, after Simon's up, we'll have Bedale. OK, is this working? Um, my name's Simon Lyle. I'm looking at organising two events. Uh, the first one is I'm looking for some people organising an LCA in Auckland in a couple of years. If you're vaguely interested in this, please come up and see me. Um, the other thing I'm interested in shorter term is a bar camp or operations type camp for people who carry a pager, so to speak. Probably in Auckland in mid uh, mid this year, coming year. Um, I'm interested to see how popular it might be and also interested in the venue, probably in central Auckland. And, um, oh, if anyone's got anything interesting, <laughs> dinner tonight, I'd be really cool. Okay, correct microphone usage. Please have it near your mouth, not down here. Yeah, so this is what happens when I actually allow myself to slip into the work world for a moment and uh, things just go wonky, but... 
that is, believe it or not, actually PowerPoint running on top of crossover on Debian. So, um, <clears throat> oh, it's it's it's. If I could figure out if I could figure out the 10 million things about this particular deck that don't work well um, in LibreOffice, I'd be a happier guy. But I tell you what, instead of trying to pull this up, let me just. Um, I can't figure out how to put this into slideshow mode on the second display. F5? If F5 actually brought it up instead of giving me a black screen, it'd be okay. Is that this one? I am clicking. <laughs> oh, that's just, this is just wacky. It's bringing the menu up in the other window. Um, Okay, look, I'm not going to spend the whole time trying to do this. Let me, just, let me just step through some of this stuff. I want to talk to you about two things that you probably haven't heard about because they've been talked about a lot in, um, in sort of uh, enterprise IT journals and places like that, but not so much in the free software world. And yet, I think they're really important for you to know about other things that are happening in HP that, that are kind of exciting. The first one is called, um, oh man, <coughs> I can't click there at all. Can I do this? Can I? This is going to drive me nuts. Yeah, I'm going to give up. Okay, so there's two programs. One is called Odyssey. Um, and and the, one of the cool things is that for the first time in my memory, um, HP has actually publicly disclosed two major programs and given them cool project names. Um, <coughs> uh, the first one is Odyssey. Uh, for those of you who've known me for a long time, I'm actually hosted in HP within the business critical server part of the enterprise server storage and networking part of HP. I think sometimes um, the, the media focuses uh, so intensely on things that are happening with WebOS and consumer devices that they lose track of you know, some of the exciting things that are happening in the rest of the business. Um, Odyssey is a program um, by which HP is recognizing and acknowledging the tectonic shift that's been going on in mission critical computing. Um, you know, <clears throat> we talk in the Linux world about how uh, Linux is capable of handling ever more business critical workloads with time, but even today, uh, the kinds of customers that are willing to spend money for the things that we currently deliver for mission critical computing, like uh, HPUX on Itanium, believe that only about 5% of the workloads that they define as mission critical could actually be served by Linux today. So what Odyssey is all about is trying to respond to this and the intersection of that with the growing interest in deploying more mission critical applications on more industry standard kinds of hardware by adding to our existing uh, high-end server portfolio uh, x86-64 um, processor architecture. And so you're going to see <coughs> dual architecture, um, high-end iron, including um, uh, new blades coming in the high-end blade servers. Uh, Superdome, Superdome 2 will have x86-64 uh, processors in it. Um, and those will end up not running HPUX. They'll be running either uh, mission critical hardened Windows or Linux. And this all of a sudden means that lots of the things that our customers today assume that they have to buy a commercial version of Unix um, and a proprietary iron to be able to get in mission critical computing space are going to start showing up contributed into various open source projects to help uh, enhance Linux to the point where it can be a reasonable platform uh, for more of those mission critical workloads to be deployed by our customers. So that's Odyssey, Moonshot. Um, I love the name of this because just as um, the Kennedy inspired um, Go to the Moon in a Decade program was a really big deal that covered a lot of ground and had a lot of risk associated with it, Moonshot is all about trying to take advantage of radically lower uh, energy solutions um, in server space. What does that mean? Well, it means that we're talking about restructuring the way servers and data centers are built. It involves things like ARM processor architecture, uh, Linux, uh, different approaches to managing storage. Uh, there's all kinds of interesting stuff. Uh, the first hardware platform is a uh, server development and evaluation platform codenamed Redstone. Uh, you'll start to hear more about that in the press in coming months. There's a Pathfinder program with a bunch of initial partners, including people like Canonical and Red Hat, along with uh, AMD, ARM, uh, Calzada, I forget who else. Um, and uh, once again, uh, these are platforms which will end up running um, probably mostly Linux, some Windows, 
and probably not a whole lot of proprietary operating systems. So when I say tectonic shift, I think this is a really big deal. I hope that it ends up being really exciting over the next couple of years as a lot more uh, technology that HP's held very tightly and very closely over the years starts to show up in open source code. Thanks. This is for Thomas. Thomas, go out there. There was someone come. Thank you. Uh, my name's Thomas Sprinkmeyer. I gave the one geek per classroom talk, OGPC. Everybody is born a geek. Everybody is born needing to examine and disassemble stuff, but most people lose it. Everybody in this room has regained it or has retained it. I challenge you to find a geekling and inspire them because we need more geeks. <laughs> okay? OGPC.com.au has the stuff I've got and a bunch of links to some really awesome other sites. I hope you find it useful. I hope you find the time to inspire a geekling. I hope we get more geeks. Thank you very much. There are some uncomfortable looking people sitting along the sides. If you've got seats closer to, to the centre, if you have empty seats closer to the centre than you are, please move inwards. Hi everyone. Um, I'm going to be talking about other Linux Australia related things. Um, so I think um, that didn't very come up very well, but I thought this conference was absolutely awesome. Who agrees with me? Yeah. It was awesome. Um, but it's kind of over more, over now. Um, but did you know Linux Australia runs other conferences too? So if you want more conferencing goodness, um, <laughs> I plan to. Um, there's Drupal Down Under. Sorry you've missed it this year. It was just before LCA. But they plan to run it again next year. So that's awesome if you're into Drupal, I guess. Um, <laughs> There's work camps. Um, there are a couple last year, one in Gold Coast, one in Melbourne. Um, I don't believe they're running this year, but if you're interested in, you should run a work camp. Um, WordPress people. <laughs> um, PyCon AU is a Linux Australia event, and Chris is going to come up and convince you that it's the best thing slice, since sliced bread next. Um, it's an awesome conference, come along. Um, not strictly Linux Australia, but Linux Australia has helped fund a, a bunch of them. There are bar camps all around Australia. Um, run one or go to one. Um, they're pretty awesome. Um, and not strictly Linux Australia either. There's the Open Source Developers Conference. Um, it's slightly different focus than um, Linux.conf.au, but I've been to it a couple of times and it's been really good. Um, I highly recommend that you go along and do more open source goodness. Um, but LA has really um, started to try and get more conferences started. So if you've got an open source conference that you want to run, come and talk to the LA um, Council because they can reduce the amount of paperwork you have to do to minimal. Um, it was really, really helpful when we started PyCon AU, and I highly suggest everybody else come along and run their own conference. Um, another thing, user groups. User groups are awesome. They've kind of been dying out, which is really, really sad. Um, I'm president of the Sydney Alliance user group, and I think it's awesome, and I think you should all come along. Um, to help you, I've got a couple of names. In Sydney, you've got the Sydney Alliance user group, which is now a subcommittee of Linux Australia. If you want to run your user group and want to save on paperwork, become a user group under Linux Australia. It like, saves all your paperwork. You don't have to have an accountant. You don't have to have all these things that incorporated entities tend to need. Um, you can just have fun doing cool open source stuff. Um, if you're in Canberra, there's Clug. Um, if you're in SA, there's Linux SA. Um, if you're in Melbourne, you've got a choice of two, in fact. Um, they're a bit greedy, those Melbourne people. Um, <laughs> you've got Love and Mlug. Um, there's more and more that I could talk about. There's like 
Hamburg and Brisbane, there's Plug and Perth, Plug and there's some in here in Ballarat as well. Go to that link and you'll find <laughs> out about them, and I'm quickly running out of time. Um, so there are other things. Who here has a blog? I'm, they're kind of going out of fashion since, like, this year. Um, but if you have a blog, put up your hand. Um, if your blog is on Linux Australia, you, uh, Planet Linux Australia, you can put your hand down. Everybody else, you should send an email to planetatlinux.org.au to become part of um, the planetatlinux.org.au community. It's a really interesting blog to follow. Um, I follow it, and I don't read everything, but I find out about cool, interesting projects um, that I'd normally only find out by coming to these conferences. And you can kind of get a tip about what's going to be hot next year at LCA. So definitely subscribe to Planet Linux Australia and get your blog on Planet Linux Australia. Thank you very much. Um, please support Linux Australia. Please come and um, join them, become a member. Um, it's free. And be awesome. Okay, next up we have Jason White, followed by Chris. Um, most of the widely used Linux desktop environments and applications have open bugs regarding their accessibility to people with disabilities. The GNOME Foundation is running an accessibility fundraising campaign at the moment. Uh, if you're interested in contributing to any of those tasks or in bringing new contributors in, into the community to work on them, there are opportunities available in this area. Uh, which I would uh, respectfully suggest that people may consider when they're looking at what they might work on or uh, encourage others to work on. Ready? Cool. So, hi. I'm here to talk to you about PyCon Australia. Um, this, is be, this year will be the third time that we've run this conference. Uh, the first couple of years it was in Sydney. That uh, It was run by Tim Ansel and co. They did a really awesome job of it. Um, so, this year we're taking it from Sydney to Hobart. Well, it's, it's Australia's conference for Python programmers. Uh, and if you take nothing away from this lightning talk, just know that it's on on the 18th and 19th of August this year. That's a weekend. And it will be held at the West Point Convention Centre in Hobart. Uh, it's underwritten by Linux Australia. We do a great job of running uh, Linux.com.au. Uh, I'm familiar with them. Uh, we try to cater for every skill level in, uh, in Python. Uh, if you don't know Python, PyCon Australia is a great opportunity to learn Python from experienced trainers. It can be a really cost-effective way, uh, way to learn it. Um, if you're already a Python developer, you can enhance your skills because we'll have presentations and tutorials and panel sessions on implementations and libraries and frameworks for Python from the people who write the libraries and, uh, and experts on them. And if you develop on tools for Python, you can help shape the future of Python at our conference sprints. Uh, there'll also be great social events at the conference. Uh, we'll have, start off with the Code Wars programming tournament. Uh, there'll be a, the Women in Python breakfast, and we're really, really excited about our conference dinner, and it would probably be worth the price of admission alone for that. Um, awesome. Yes, it will be awesome, Tim. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, uh, how can you help with, um, with PyCon Australia? Well, the first thing we want to know is what you want to see at the conference. Uh, at our website, we're running a call for topics, which is basically the reverse of a call for presentations. We want you, as delegates or potential delegates, to tell us what topics you'd like to see presented at the conference, or perhaps who you would like to see present at the conference. And if you tell us these things, we can find a talk for you. So head over to our website at pycon-au.org and fill out our call for topics form. Uh, if you're interested in speaking at PyCon Australia this year, we'll open our normal call for proposals probably mid-February. Uh, to keep in contact with the things that we're planning on doing with PyCon Australia, uh, we have a mailing list. Go to our website and sign up for that. You can follow us on Twitter at PyConAU, and we're also on Google+. Um, so yeah, come along to PyCon Australia in Hobart this year. It's going to be awesome. Jim 
is going to speak while Ian sets up. Uh, swap. Okay, who in the audience has a Gmail account or a Google account or a friend with a Google account? All right, keep your hands up. Um, put your hand down if you've got two-factor authentication enabled. All right, everyone with your hands up, you need to go home and tell your loved ones, tell your friends, tell your family to please turn on two-factor authentication. Um, increasingly, this is becoming a very severe issue for us where also for all sorts of different things, malware, um, people typing their passwords in internet cafes and stuff like that. And the Google team will do their best to help you out if this happens to you, but we prefer it didn't happen at all. It's very simple, google.com slash accounts, um, click enable, install the app on your phone or get SMS authentication and try and avoid becoming another person with a compromised email account. Thank you very much. Hello, it's the Blue Hacker thing again. Can I, can I do the usual show of hands? What? Swap mics? What? Where's the other one? Where's the other one? Okay. <laughs> Hello, it's me again. Oh, no, it's not. Yes, it is. All right. So, can I, can I do the, for some of you, not that usual show of hands again? Who here has dealt with or is dealing with the depression at some point in their life? Yes, see, this is still quite a significant number. Now, don't put your hands down. Up, up, up. Yes, <laughs> excellent. Yeah, you know the deal. Okay, now look around you. Yes, you're not alone. That was the original idea, which I did in 2008, and then I ran off. Um, a couple of minutes later, um, somehow, out of nothing, uh, bluehackers.org appeared. Um, so that was quite an, uh, quite an awesome thing. I didn't actually expect that. I had absolutely no idea what I was doing at the time. Um, I was dealing with depression. Um, so since then, mainly you will have seen stickers. Now, how many of you have stickers on their laptops? That little blue, that's pretty good. If you didn't stick your hand up, you want one of those stickers. Unless there's corporate reasons why you don't have that sticker, please put it on. It's not for you necessarily, it's to show other people that they're not alone. And that I think is really, really important. Now, I have many, many stickers here. Most of them come in twos, but there are some sheets of 42 outside on the table. And particularly if you're traveling to somewhere else on the planet, please grab one or two um, or five or ten of these sheets. I printed two years ago 13,600 of these things. <laughs> there are a few left and since you're all donating money back, I think it's already made its money back so we can print more. So please take them and that's only half. I still have like 5,000 at home. Okay? So for free to take some, it's not a problem. You don't have to take one or two, you can take heaps. Um, you can follow on Twitter, blog and so on just with interesting ideas. Now the latest thing, I was working on a talk for originally LCA, it didn't happen here but it happened at OSTC, a little talk about cognitive psychology, as you do, diverse interest. Um, while I was making that presentation, I decided or I thought about, this idea would really work well as a board game. So now there's a board game. You could call it a Blue Hackers board game, I don't know. Anyway, the name for it that I've chosen is Equilibria, because the idea is not to be ridiculously positive. Um, those people are usually called salespeople, and they're completely devoid of reality. Um, <laughs> yeah. Others have talk, spoken about that during the week. So the idea is to, to balance out your, your thought processes and not be ridiculously negative or positive because those things are both unhealthy and or dangerous. Um, there is a play testing um, session after the end of the conference today. Unfortunately, you will have to miss the stargazing. It's a choice you have to make. Um, so at 5.30 today, we're gathering in the, let's say in the hall here outside at Cara, and then gathering some food. Various people still have some food oh, left over from Tuesday or other shopping events. And we're going to the common room in the accommodation here and we're going to be doing play testing. It'll be in sessions of six people at a time because I only have one set and I need to, to see what's going on while it's playing so I can actually write down any feedback. Um, it's a board game. Who here likes board games? There you go. Thank you very much. Okay, we should be looking for Paul. Yes, come on. Cool. 
Hi, everybody. Um, who would like to be able to remember more stuff? Yay, everyone. OK, I want to tell you about a fantastic program which I discovered a couple of months ago called Anki, A-N-K-I. It is free. It is open source software. It runs on Mac, uh, Windows, and Linux systems. It has an iPhone client. It has an Android client. It has a mobile web interface. And it has Cloud Sync. So it runs on everything. What it lets you do is it lets you prepare. Thank you. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Mike Lake, and this is... Jill Rowling. Hi. Right. About two years ago, we decided to um, get a farm and uh, run our packers. And I wanted something to look after all of our packers and see what they're doing when, in fact, we're at places like this conference here, you see, because we're from Sydney, and the farm's in the central west of New South Wales. So, had to have something that was... Nice camera, had to be wireless, had to be solar powered, um, really wanted to run open source, of course. So, um, this is a system diagram. Okay, we've got uh, a Mobotics camera, which is from Germany. That goes into a ubiquity wireless access point, which is in the paddock. Now, those two things in the paddock, they're on a wooden cart made of wooden palings from Bunnings, four wheels, um, some plumbing pipe to hold them up in the air and handle so we can drag it along through the paddocks, you see, and position it. Then the wireless, which is 5.8 gigahertz, goes off to the wireless access point at the farmhouse. And, of course, um, the wireless access points run Linux and there's a switch and a little fit PC2i that gets stored on it. And um, there happens to be also a weather station as well. And then it goes into a modem and into the satellite, and then all the way back to places like this place on the internet. So, what do we got? Um, Mobotics camera. It runs Linux 2.6. Really tops. Um, we've got three megapixels, and it's got into quite a nice file system, and you can actually SSH into it, and it actually transfers its data to the Fit PC2 via NFS. Okay, ubiquity. Now, um, I think it was Dale or someone, so they were using uh, bullet, ubiquity bullet stations. This is a nano station, also runs Linux, and also runs BusyBox, Ash, Light HTTPB, uh, Drop Bear, um, IP tables, all sorts of things. And it's got a nice web interface as well. Oh, that's the Fit PC2i. It actually fits in the palm of my hand. It's about three and a half, four inches across. Uh, only runs four watts of power which is really good. All stuff comes into there. Oh, that's the back of it. It's got two gigabit ethernets because the, uh, I'm getting 100 megabits per second coming in, so I need some gigabit ethernet to get the stuff out. Um, well, yeah, the system diagram looks really neat, but that's actually how it looks like. Um, it comes in a cable, in comes the video feeds, um, goes into a, uh, the switch, there's some uninterruptible power supplies, etc. The Fit PC2 also runs a um, web-based album by Dave Madison from Marginal Hacks, which is open source. Um, I'm also using rsync to transfer it up to my website, and it runs some Python scripts and some cron jobs and bash shell scripts to tie it all together. And then it goes up the pipe into the satellite. And then, yeah, from there, somehow it gets to the internet. I don't know how it does that. Um, <laughs> I suspect the satellite modem is running Linux too, but I haven't been able to hack into that one yet. And then what we get out of it is this. Okay, that's the actual pictures that we get in Sydney. And they sort of eat grass, basically. We've got about 50 alpacas. They laze about doing nothing. They sunbake when it's warm. <laughs> yep, they have a look at the camera. <laughs> Yeah, it rains. We've got a weather station as well, which also we can tell the weather. <laughs> and that's the end. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Next up will be Peter Leo and filling in the slot will be somebody else.
will be Thomas. Thomas Milenovic? Grab the mic from over there, please. Hello, I'd like some help or advice on setting up a text-to-vocal system compatible with LilyPonds. I've done this before in the past, but it accidentally didn't end up being free software. Um, <laughs> I'd like something that's compatible with Speech Dispatcher and plugs into LilyPonds uh, media pre and text processing. And currently the plan is to use VST plugins and uh, uh, to make GST sound patches for MIDI instruments for each phenome. <laughs> Thanks, contact me. Hi everyone, uh, my name's Peter Lawler, I'm giving a quick talk about Tuz and Friends. Um, what is a Tuz? Well, Tuz was uh, the mascot, some of you may remember, from uh, Linux Conf in Hobart in 2009. It's a Tasmanian devil with a strap-on penguin beak, which is all a bit weird. Um, it was for fundraising for the uh, research into devil facial tumour disease, and it was also the logo for the Linux 2629 release. Um, just, a, uh, just a couple of quick facts about the Tasmanian devil. Um, it's native to the main island of Tasmania, so it's not on King or Flinders Island. Um, in the wild, they mature at two years and live to around about five years. Um, they're now an endangered species, and they're not really that much like the Warner Brothers character. Although they do kind of sound like it sometimes. Um, what is the devil facial tumour disease? Well, um, it was first recorded in 1996 and it's caused by cancerous, uh, infectious cancerous cells. It's uh, one of only three uh, infectious cancers on the planet. Um, there's one that affects dogs and another that affects rodents in Syria. It's always fatal. Um, there's no known cure or vaccine. And since 1996, uh, sightings of the devil in the wild have dropped from, uh, dropped by 85 to 97%. Um, so I'm just going to go through some of the facts that came out of the Devil Report that was published in December last year. Um, they've gone from an ad hoc uh, fundraising basis to major sponsors. A couple of the major sponsors are Collins Debden, who produced diaries, so you can get saved Hazy Devil uh, diaries. Uh, Virgin Australia apparently chucked some money at them. Um, but there's also items for sale online and at local stores around Tasmania. And, um, oh, down there, if I can just grab him, or someone can chuck him up. You might have seen me running around with a plush toy that was at um, Linux Confo 9, available for sale. It's no longer for, available for sale or giveaway, um, so you've got a collector's item. I've heard that there are none. Okay. Anyway. Um, so they tried uh, some suppression techniques into devil facial tumour disease, um, reviewed in late 2010, indicated some success but not enough to keep uh, the populations or eradicate the disease. Um, so they've established some insurance populations, uh, 20 locations around Australia in every state and territory, organised by the Zoo and Aquarium Association, aims for 100% genetic diversity and that population was expected to reach 450 uh, by the end of last year. Um, there are a few free-range enclosures about in Tasmania. Two new uh, Devil Islands, as they're called, were opened last year. They hold about 40 um, animals who are all nice and healthy. Um, there's also a Devil Ark kept up in New South Wales. That's 500 hectares. Um, the reason it's in New South Wales, the environment up in Barrington Tops is similar to Tasmania. And at the time of the report writing, eight of the 13 females had pouch young which was kind of rather promising because it indicates the devils are slightly happy about where they are. Um, now, uh, there's also a Tarkine Devil Program. The Tarkine is a, uh, lar Australia's largest temperate rainforest in the far northwest of Tasmania. And the first results from this were published last week. Out of the 1,283 uh, images that they captured using motion sensing cameras in the wild, not a single image indicated any infection, which is fairly promising. <laughs> now, if you're visiting Tasmania, we have this thing called the Roadkill Project, which I just love the name of that. Um, it's crowdsourced by using dead trees, so you fill out a form, 
um, about squash devils that you might see or if you're not driving attentively, you might cause. Uh, these forms are available from the Royal Automobile Club, car rental uh, companies, visitor info centres, parks and wildlife centres, service Tasmania, private wildlife parks, or you can download it at the website uh, tassiedevil.com.au. Um, take the form, if you visit Tasmania, just take the form, put it in the car and uh, just write it down. And if you're in the west of Tasmania, there's also an SMS number that you can uh, send a message to and uh, just for the west of Tasmania because they're really, really interested. They want to collect all the carcasses in the west of Tasmania. Um, the west of Tasmania. Other bits of Tasmania, eh, depends whether they're actually investigating that area at the time. Um, and in conclusion, yeah, free TUS. Um, uh, TUS was sold at LCA 09 as fundraising. Um, it has also been given away elsewhere. Um, it's a great talking point about devil facial tumour disease and open source. You can kill two birds with one, or one devil. Um, <laughs> and if you did receive a free TUS, I'd just like to encourage you to please donate. And uh, tazzydevil.com.au. Thank you. Okay, next up is Nicholas and Paul. <laughs> So, what I was saying before, Anki is, <laughs> Anki is space repetition software. So, what it does is you have flashcards and it figures out when you're about to forget something and then it shows you the flashcards to help you remember. Now, the cool thing about the flashcards is you can put anything you want on those. They can be images, they can be text, but you can download other people's flashcard decks that they've already written. So, if you want to learn Japanese or your amino acids or the list of cognitive biases or all the countries in the world, you can do that using Anki decks. Thank you. Well, I should run a little bit, but okay, I'm, I am. I am Nicolas, Nicolas Herdodi. I am your multicore guy. I'm from New Zealand. New Zealand? Someone here? Good. Excellent. I'm from Uruguay, too. Someone here? Okay, so, right. I've been throwing all these leaflets about multicore world, which is a conference that we organize in Wellington, 27, 28th of March which you should be checking the website right now, but unfortunately. So please go to multicoreworld.com and if you go to the speakers, you will see that uh, the lineup of speakers that we have there, it's really, really awesome. We have the director of software of Intel, we have the director of CSIO on the SKA project, we have uh, Tim Madson from Kronos OpenCL. Okay. <laughs> well, let's keep talking then. So essentially, uh, we are a group of geeks on an organization called Open Parallel. We work on the big vision. We believe that Australia and New Zealand have all the characteristics to become a global hub, a center of excellence in multi-core and parallel programming. Uh, we have been working on this since 2005, 2006, organizing an ecosystem from academia, from developers, from engineers, from industry, and you. So I organized the mini-conf on Wellington, 60 people attended. Organized a mini-conf in Brisbane, 200 people attended. We had a... Oh, hello. Look at that. Okay. And I still have... Thank you. And then the idea is that this starts here, so you should be checking the website now, and then you know that parallelism is everywhere, and everything is love and peace like this. Nice sky, everyone is organized. Unfortunately, it's not like that because things happen. Not only that, but up there. So essentially, the big point is that in order to avoid these sort of things, it's good if you go there. And there, we will aiming to put 300 people this time. So in the same place where LCA was in Wellington in 2010, we are aiming in a very ambitious goal to put 300 people together. And that's, that's the theme. A different amount of people talking about all things multi-core. So these are our confirmed speakers. Half dozen of them will come from the United States. 
uh, you can see that there are science, there are language, there are servers. But the other thing that is interesting, it's investors, salespeople, IT departments. So it's reasonable, a good lineup, but we want more people too. So it's two days, just one track. But the idea is that we know each other. We talk about what sort of applications, what sort of business, what sort of things can be done now, not in five years' time. So if you go to a university conference, you will see things that will happen in the future. If you go to an engineering or a geek conference, you will talk about code. But if you go to a business conference, uh, what should I buy? Why? When? Where? So we strongly believe, and that's our vision, that the challenge on parallel programming, it's, well, it's, a, it's again a software challenge. We have been talking about open hardware. We have been talking about a number of things. I strongly believe that we have opportunities here, and open societies like New Zealand and Australia can do very, very interesting things. So, if you think that this mix of people is interesting and you want to be part of it, please just simply have a look that we still have tickets at early bird, but the call for papers will finish a month before the conference. And we really, really want to have as much as people possible, but the conference is already a success. Why? because we are creating the ecosystem, and that's the awareness. So we plan to do it every year. We plan to do it in New Zealand, in Australia, but the idea is just to be together, work together, because parallelism is everywhere. Thank you very much. Okay, next, next after this is Stuart with Donna in the middle. Hello. Um, just a quick hands up, who remembers my lightning talk from last year? Not very many of you. Uh, so I was going to do an update, but I'll have to do a quick what the fuck was that about. Oops, I saw, sorry. So uh, I discovered that a 19th century journal called The Dawn, a journal for Australian women, was not online. And this was strange to me, so I decided it should be online. <laughs> Raised over eight and a half thousand dollars, eight and a half thousand dollars raised, sent to the National Library. They are digitising the dawn. It will be online by it will be online by March the eighth, International Women's Day, 2012, at the Trove. Awesome. Hello. Okay. I want to tell you about a great project that I and about like 30 of other friends were involved in, so it's not just me. Uh, how to build a monorail, because I wanted to talk about something that has absolutely nothing to do with technology here, because we should all do other interesting things. So it has nothing to do with technology except for all the Arduino. <laughs> so I go for a thing called Burning Man. It is great. It has a theme every year. Uh, in 2010, the theme was Metropolis. So what does every modern metropolis have as a transportation of the future? The <laughs> Monorail, so just like Seattle or Sydney, which goes nowhere to nowhere, or Seattle, uh, transportation of the future in 1962, and all the other cities that are definitely on the map. What is it called? Monorail. So if you're going to design a monorail, where is the best place to go? Of course, you go to Wikipedia. And of course, the first thing you find, you go, oh crap, I want one of those, is a gyroscopically balanced monorail. <laughs> okay. So what you discover then is like that's hilarious because you run out of power and it leads to the size and falls over. So instead, because most of the people lived in Seattle, we went for the Seattle design. Uh, and there's a guy that's actually built one in his backyard. So there's the URL for that. And it looks a bit like this. So it's out of wood and it goes around the backyard and it's really cool. <laughs> Travel there, pass the train. <laughs> if you laugh, I won't finish. <laughs> 
And then what we do is we, they had a big curve in there. And the problem with going around the corner was it was actually took them five years to get that design and manufacture right. So we decided to go on a straight line. So what did you do? Well, we started having sketchups of how it's going to look and have people there, not to scale, or oh, cool looking car. And there's engineers involved, so there's like proper diagrams of how everything's going to be built for the stations and everything. But where do monorails go? Anyone who's been to Seattle or Sydney or the any other cities that have one, uh, they go nowhere to nowhere, stopping nowhere in between. So this is an aerial photo of Burning Man. You have the man there, which is a big point, and then you have the temple there, it's a big point. We wanted to put it there, across there, going to nowhere to nowhere. Uh, <laughs> The people who built the temple said that would be really annoying and would piss them off, so instead we had to build it that way, so it almost went somewhere down it. Anyway, <laughs> what do you do for building material? Well, of course, metal is excellent. It has very predictable stress qualities, so you're not going to kill people, because apparently that's bad. Uh, but wood is cheap. <laughs> wood used for structural purposes is expensive, so the stuff that make you use to build your house, that costs money. So use cheap, shitty wood. Downside, wood is a composite. So this has a whole bunch of different properties than metal. So it's essentially, we may as well be making it out of carbon fiber. So how do we solve this? Let's use math. So of course, the benefit of having engineers, including structural like aer aerospace and the like, is we could do a whole bunch of maths on like wood properties and how this will fit together and what, wind, what loads would be under various winds and people leaning out the side and doing all sorts of silly things. And we had a whole bunch of fun with, of course, this calculation is dodgy. <laughs> So it was absolutely perfect to make sure that anyone killing themselves would be their own damn fault, not ours. So testing, what do you do? Uh, have 600 pounds of vertical load test, drinking a beer right underneath it because safety third. <laughs> so full vertical load test, of course we did torsion tests and we modified the design and hanging stuff all there, you would need one metric hot tub full of water because that's where you get 600 pounds of weight for free. Don't drink it, it's disgusting. Uh, <laughs> It's going to be eight foot high, 500 feet off the ground. It required about as much wood it takes to build a house. Of course, you need a car to go along the monorail, some wheels on top, some wheels to the sides to balance it, and some cool stuff on the side to make it look cool. It takes two people. You have stations. They kind of have sides, look a bit like a city, with a whole bunch of like uh, about 14 or 20 watts of LED lights each with Arduinos controlling the colors between them was really cool, which of course requires a bunch of wire, a bunch of soldering, putting wires together, and then you need to light up the track so at night people don't uh, ride into it, drive their cars through it, or ride their bikes and cut their head off. Uh, so you need 540 watts of LED rope light. <laughs> so how do you do construction? Well, you get a week before Burning Man, you start constructing two sections of track, then you build more sections of track, start putting a scaffolding up for the uh, uh, stations, and then put you know, warning things in there to have people stop killing themselves, check the car, make sure everything's going on, get a forklift, put it up on top, screw everything together, cross brace it so everything's going to stay properly, put the metal shiny stuff on the side so it like burns your eyes in the middle of the day, uh, and then discover that you didn't have anyone who knows how to build an electric car, um, because that turns out to be hard and have whole sorts of propulsion troubles and need a ladder to get on and off it and all that kind of thing. But then it's really cool because you invent a new unit of measurement, which is mono uh, monorail unit, because we're in America, so therefore it's like imperial. Uh, you have the stations in the daylight, which look really cool. It got tagged, which was excellent. It looked lit up at night, and it was great. You could see your artwork from miles and miles and miles around, uh, which is excellent. This is the only photo I could find of it moving. Uh, there was great rumors of why it wasn't moving at various times. Favorite ones involved, it shut down because somebody died. Ha ha. Uh, and of course, at the end, we burnt it. <laughs> the small amount of source code is, of course, on the internet, which is actually branched off the Groovix cube. Uh, also, stuff you should do is totally develop your own film, because it's great. It doesn't involve bloody computers that don't work, or software that doesn't work. Brew your own beer, because it is absolutely delicious. And definitely, if you can't change your life, at least change your socks. Uh, and I swear never to make art again. Okay, while Vasti gets ready, let's get Rob Thomas up on stage. Really quick one. I'm the guy who was giving out all the VoIP services, and I've done a little bit of number crunching. We had 328 external calls, um, more than 200 internal calls. I'm not sure how many actually succeeded. The total cost of all the calls of everyone using it was $111.56. Um, the number of highest um, registrations was 122. Most expensive call was $7 for a seven minute call to New Zealand. The longest call was 44, 42 minutes to Sydney. Thanks very much. Okay, you're on. Cool. 
I didn't need five minutes. I didn't need five minutes, so I asked some friends to help me. Joel, you're up. <laughs> Thank you. My name's Joel. I like playing with hardware. Uh, so our phones, inside phones that you have in your pocket, there's two processors, sort of. One runs the baseband, that's all the signal processing stuff. The other ones run, run applications. That's Android, that's Mego, that's OpenMoco, that's I, whatever. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have stuff that runs on the baseband side. This is bad, because as you know from last night, uh, our phones can track us. We don't know what runs on that side. So some guys wrote some software to do that side. Pretty complicated, uh, lots of signal processing going on, a bit of reverse engineering. Uh, when you have a phone that runs your own baseband, you can do really interesting things, like see what security protocols this <clears throat> the network has implemented. When you do that, you can make graphs to see how secure our phone networks are. Someone's done this for, for Australia, uh, as well as other places around the world. If you happen to get your hands on one of those phones, you can upload the data to this website and let everyone know how insecure our networks are. Thank you. A few years ago, I was worried about this, so I bought one of these. I pulled this out. <laughs> I put one of these in, and a bunch of these. Now I get my fuel from here, and don't use any of this. Thank you. Josh. Josh is supposed to emerge at this point, spontaneously from the... Oh, God. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> All right. So, following the crowd, I'll go for a show of hands. Who here wants an LCA 2012 sticker? Excellent. That's almost every hand in the audience. I wanted them too. They didn't exist, so I made some. So, go here. They should be live in the, sometime in the next 24 hours. Remember the star? It's very important. It means that LCA gets 25% of every sticker sold. Thanks. Go get some. Cool. So, um, this is the thing I actually wanted to talk about. Um, there are people out there doing really, really cool stuff. And some of them are not actually here. We need to fix this. So, we've been talking about this idea where People at the conference, uh, people who attend the conference, who love the conference, should basically get together and we should produce a huge list of people you want to come and speak at the conference and we'll basically put it up somewhere. This announcement will be coming soon. Um, and check off, yes, I have personally sent this person the call for papers because I know them and I can get them uh, to actually read it. Um, and anyone left on the list who hasn't been sent, who people want to see, who hasn't been sent the call, the paper committee will do the work for you and approach them. So start thinking now about who you want to see at LCA next year and watch out for the Linux Australia call uh, to help with this paper roundup sort of thing. Okay, so here are some topics that you might want. Um, obviously, Antarctica is going to be topical next year. Okay, uh, and now uh, Mark Jessup is actually not here to give this talk um, about the Project Horus where they launch balloons, but if I did this right, which I'm not, then... Um, they're doing a balloon launch like about uh, an hour ago or so. You go to this URL and you can actually see where it is right now. This is the last one they did. Um, so go to that URL and you can see what's happening with their balloon launch right now. So, it's about 18 Ks. 18 Ks away, cool. Okay, so all of you should be getting out your laptops and looking that up. Done. Julian, did you want a couple of seconds? Whoa, echo. All right, so I work I'm rusty. Um, in my day job. I work at Google Network Operations. We do a lot with IPv6. Um, as some of you may have heard, we had World IPv6 Day last year, which was a day where a bunch of sites, um, Google, Facebook, some Akamai, many, many others, um, turned on IPv6 for a day and then pretty much switched it off. We don't like switching stuff off. We're too lazy to do that. So we're going to do it again this year. But, well, we're going to leave it on. Um, wow. 
I, I should point out these slides were done by some very helpful co-workers because I was too lazy. Um, if, seriously, big thanks to Internode who you would be amazed how helpful it is to actually have end user networks connected. And if you work on or associated with a big website and you guys are having, tr and you're having trouble with IPv6, do, do, do. Um, my email address is there or World IPv6 Day will have resources. Come and see me if you're around. And in general, prepare, be awesome. It doesn't break the internet. And after June 6th, if you turn on IPv6 and it breaks, it's your fault because, so, because otherwise Google, Facebook, et al. are already broken for, the, for other people. And fortunately, most people notice that. So June 6th, come on, turn it on. It's hideously overdue. <laughs>